Hello, everyone. Uh, you are watching Senzala Insights. This is our first English edition. <laughs> we have first international guest on our, our podcast. And uh, this is uh, Nikolas Kovacevic, CEO of Greenline Holdings. Nikolas, thank you for, for accepting to join us to this podcast. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, you are the first uh, uh, international guest. You are the first CEO of the listed company from Nasdaq, as our co podcast is actually focused on the trends in the different industries and uh, with definitely focus on the stock market. So you are the right guest and really, really, I, I really appreciate for your time and, and effort to join us and, and to help this, this, uh, this the podcast. Thank you. Thank you again. Absolutely. Nicholas, could you please tell us for and for our audience a few words about yourself and your career? And uh... yeah, so uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I've uh, been in business ever since college. Actually, uh, prior to that, I played basketball in college. Played played uh, basketball my whole uh, life growing up, and 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 through college, and then um, injuries happened, and I moved on to business. So I uh, started playing a different game. And I've uh, been in, uh, in that since uh, 2010 is when we started uh, a packaging business specifically focused around the cannabis industry. And the company was called Kush Bottles. Uh, we were very early on in the space and serving only at the time was medical marijuana markets, uh, mainly in California. And of course, uh, markets started to open up around the country in, in 2014 with uh, Colorado legalizing and, and Washington state legalizing. And now, you know, we have uh, several dozen states that have legalized for uh, cannabis for adult use purposes, um, and uh, even more that have medical cannabis here in the U.S. Um, countries like Canada have now legalized. We see Germany now marching down the legalization path. So um, it's starting to happen. Uh, and again, I've been in the industry for 12 years. Um, it's been a crazy ride during that time. Uh, we, you know, started as just a tiny little startup in a in a garage, so to speak, um, to becoming one of the first publicly traded companies in the cannabis industry, um, to doing a merger with Greenlane a year ago, uh, and that's how I became the CEO of Greenlane, uh, which is a listed company on Nasdaq, as you mentioned. Uh, so it's been a lot of ups and downs, uh, a wild ride, but but here we are, and we're on a new frontier, an emerging sector, um, and it's an exciting time. There's a lot happening. Definitely, you are one of the pioneers in, in all this industry, and I'm following all the time uh, what are the changes, and, uh, and uh, absolutely, we can see a lot of movements in the, in the right direction to accepting, uh, as you said, marijuana in medical purposes or in uh, for adult use. And uh, could you tell us a few words about the Green Line uh, Holdings and uh, what are your business model? Yeah, so one of the things that's interesting about <clears throat> the dynamics, even though cannabis is legal in so many states, including um, you know the most populous state in the country, California, and the most populous city in the country, New York, um, it is still not legal at the federal level. So the federal government has not legalized, and that creates a dynamic where companies that are involved in cannabis itself, whether they're growing the cannabis plant, processing it into oil or into edibles, or retailing cannabis to consumers, they're not allowed to be listed on the major exchanges simply because of the fact that cannabis is still federally illegal. But companies that are ancillary, um, that don't touch the plant, and we look at these companies like picks and shovels, Right. So during the gold rush, you know, some people mine or panned for gold. Other companies sold products to allow them to do that, whether that was Levi's jeans or whether that was literally pans and, and, and axes and picks. So Greenlane is a picks and shovels company. We don't actually sell cannabis, but we sell a lot of different products that are necessary in the process to getting legal cannabis consumed. Um, and what are those products? So it starts with packaging. Um, so we sell bulk packaging to a lot of the cannabis companies that are then putting their products on the shelf. Um, we sell hardware to consume. So things like vaporizers or pipes or rolling papers or, or even grinders to grind cannabis. So we have all sorts of different accessories um, that you can view them online at our B2B portal um, at greenlane.com. And then 
Uh, also, uh, we have a consumer website at vapor.com uh, where you can see some of our products as well and purchase them uh, depending on where you live. So that's what Greenline does. We're a large seller of these goods. Uh, we we uh, did last year, you know, well north of $100 million in sales. Um, so it's a big business. We can sell these products globally. Uh, so we, we do ship uh, them around the world in Europe and things like that. We use uh, sub distributors and, and uh, we use channels like Amazon. Um, here in the US, we're in uh, cannabis retail stores, we're in convenience stores or gas stations, um, and we're also selling direct to consumer online too. So we try to have an omni channel strategy. We had to try to have a very broad portfolio of products. And we want to, our mission at the company is to elevate the consumption experience. Um, so we want to create better ways. I, I, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, can tell their first time smoking cannabis. Maybe it was out of an apple or out of a Coca-Cola can. Uh, well, today we've got really high end premium accessories. So you can have a much more elevated consumption experience. Now that cannabis is more mainstream, being destigmatized and legal in so many places around the world. Yeah, so actually you are the, the marketplace. You don't have your own products. And uh, you are you are actually marketplace for the other producers of this equipment. We do both actually. We uh, historically have been more of a marketplace uh, and distributor. Um, although a few years ago we decided we wanted to build our own brands, and we saw a lot of disruption coming to the industry, especially with channels like Amazon, um, where you know people can get their products directly. There's less need for a marketplace or a distributor. Um, but more opportunity if you own your own brands. Now you can place your brands onto these other platforms like Amazon. Yeah. So we strategically decided now today um, we have probably two thirds of our sales on the consumer side is still other people's brands that we don't own. Um, but about one third of them are our own brands that we do own. Um, and these are brands like Higher Standards, Groove, which we just launched. Uh, da Vinci and Ice, which we acquired last year, those two companies. Um, so four consumer brands in the portfolio, um, and then complemented with some of the other leading brands in the marketplace so that we can have uh, a sort of a one-stop shop selection for our customers so they can stock their entire dispensary shelf or uh, smoke shop or head shop shelf uh, and have all the products that their consumers are desiring. Yes, that's definitely the the good move, smart move, actually to have your own brand, your own private label that now when everybody is uh, easy to get to the clients, as you said, through the through the Amazon, through other marketplaces is better because you are actually the guys who knows what is the best, uh, what was the best. Yeah. I, as I understand, you are the premium, uh, actually for the premium segment. We, we yeah, historically, we've been uh, a leader in premium for Going back 17 years now, Greenlane, uh, one of the first companies in the industry uh, selling uh, a German-based product, uh, the stores in Bickel, uh, Volcano Vaporizer was, was how the company started. We still sell stores in Bickel today. They're owned by Canopy Growth, who is one of the big Canadian cannabis companies. Um, and they're a partner of ours and we sell their products, great vaporizer products. But anyways, the point is 17 years of experience and knowledge carrying all these different premium accessories from all these different brands, you know, who better to be able to create brands that really resonate with the consumer. And we're also doing it at different price points. So we do have higher standards, which is our premium smoke shop, head shop brand. But now we've launched Groove, which is simple, functional, and reliable. Um, it's a more approachable brand. And we know that with some of the stuff happening at the macro, economy level, uh, you and I were talking before the show, uh, consumer spending uh, is going is, is set to trend down uh, due to inflation and, and other factors. Well, we want to have a line of products uh, that is going to perform in any macro climate. And we know consumption is going to continue for cannabis. It's, it's similar to other products like alcohol that, you know, whether the economy is good or bad, yes. uh, there's continued consumption, but uh, maybe not everyone will be able to afford our high-end Da Vinci dryer vaporizer, which is a $250 to $300 price point, we want to have options available to them, you know, at the $99 price point. And, and when it comes to other products like batteries, uh, you know, we're going to offer products, batteries that are $100, but we also want to have the $15 version for the person that just needs it 
and it's more convenient and, and they're on a they're maybe on a budget and, and that's the, the money that they can spend. So we want to have it all. Um, we're, we're just getting started with our own brand strategy, uh, but there's a bright future ahead for those different segments that we talked about and the different brands that Greenlane is bringing to market. Uh, your business is, of course, very related to the uh, license to the, so that uh, consuming the marijuana is accepted. And uh, honestly, as I also follow the, the market as uh, investors on the stocks uh, that I actually I was expecting that uh, it will be, uh, as you said, accepted on federal level years ago. I'm sure you, you and your colleagues uh, have the same feeling. But what is the reason that it's still not happening, of course, at, at least for these medical purposes? Yeah, look, there's a lot of reasons in politics in the U.S., uh, you know, they take time. And, you know, we saw, um, you know, the first state legalized in 2014. Um, <clears throat> sometimes there can be sort of a 10 year arc before it catches up with the federal legalization. We saw this with gay marriage, for example. Um, we're coming up on that 10 year mark right now. Right. We're in 2022. We're headed to 2024. Um, it's going to be right around this time where I think we see some federal progress. Uh, you know, one of the big reasons is interest and money, right? So um, who spends a lot of money with lobbyists and, and at Capitol Hill? Big Pharma. Well, you know, they're not going to want, I've replaced a, a lot of my <clears throat> pain management with natural plant-based cannabis, right? Whether you've got soreness and, uh, you know, we talk, I see you've got the historic Michael Jordan picture in your background there, but I was a college basketball player and, yeah. you know, after a game, you're taking Advil, you're taking ibuprofen or, or, or aspirin. Um, you know, people can take cannabis for that. So think about the money that's going to be lost from big pharma when a plant is comes in and, and, and can supplement or, or replace. Um, we're also seeing people that uh, are, are, are utilizing cannabis are able to get off of opiates, right? Um, so big pharma has a, a huge spend uh, with a lot of the top uh, officials in, in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. And, you know, it's no wonder that it's taken so long to get progress when it comes to medical. And then when it comes to adult use, there's another industry that has uh, a pretty uh, pretty strong uh, lock on socializing with vices, and that's the alcohol industry. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, look, a lot of people are now switching away from alcohol. Uh, they call it here in California, they call it Cali Sober where you don't drink alcohol, but you still consume cannabis. Um, and we are also seeing uh, just in general, people moving to non-alcoholic beverages and even the alcohol companies are starting to get into that segment. Um, so we know that people are turning away from alcohol. Um, it's not hard to know why. Uh, it's, it's a very toxic product. I mean, I love the product. I, I, I like to consume, but you know, you get hung over. Um, it doesn't, you don't feel good. It's not good for your body. And, um, you know, people consuming uh, wine or, or other mixed drinks, you know, there's a lot of calories involved, right? So now cross that to cannabis, which is uh, a natural product. Uh, there's no hangover. It helps you sleep better, right? Alcohol disrupts your sleep. Cannabis improves your sleep. And, you know, you don't need much to, 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 to get high, right? Uh, you know, one five milligram or 10 milligram beverage or, you know, a gummy bear or, you know, a couple hits and, it does the trick. So, um, you know, people aren't consuming the calories. They're 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 switching over, and alcohol is scared about that. They don't want cannabis to become, you know, and take their market share, especially when it comes to socializing, because um, cannabis is, even though it's legal, is is relatively confined to the house, whereas you can go to a restaurant or go to a bar and consume alcohol socially. Um, the alcohol industry has slowed the progress of that happening for cannabis. It's finally starting to happen. These things called consumption lounges, finally starting to get traction in certain markets uh, where the regulations have, have evolved, but it's only local. It's not national, as I mentioned earlier, right? So um, big alcohol, big pharma, those are two very big industries that are putting a lot of money uh, into Congress and, and, and into politics to slow the advancement of cannabis. So we know that's a factor. Um, also, it's a nature of the partisan uh, politics that this country has uh, has evolved into, right? Um, you know, where basically if, if you're on one side of the aisle, you're staunchly 
uh, you know, this way and you're on the other side of the aisle, you're staunchly the other way. And so, you know, it's hard to, to create progress, even with a very popular issue like cannabis. It has 70 percent uh, popularity. It's more popular than uh, any presidential candidate has been in the recent years. And uh, but still, the, the fact is, um, you know, it's it's if, if the Democrats want to get it done then the Republicans want to block it, if the Republicans want to get it done a certain way, then the Democrats want to block it. And you just have that issue going on as well. So there's a myriad of, of factors. Um, everybody understands it's a matter of when, not if. Right. It will happen. But when and how and how are they going to do it? Right. Because now there's influence from pharma and alcohol to do it a certain way so that maybe they can benefit. Um, and so there's going to be a big battle over how legalization happens in the U.S. as well. And that's all, I think, set to play out over the next few years. We're finally getting some momentum. President Biden has come out saying uh, that, you know, there needs to be some progress uh, on uh, rescheduling or descheduling cannabis and expunging records for, for folks that were put in prison. And he's already started on that. So we, we are in, in a historic time where there's more progress than ever. But Washington is slow and uh, it's going to take a little bit of time before we get fully there. I can understand that explanation completely, and uh, we can see that everywhere globally that this, uh, as I said, money makes the world <laughs> turn around. And uh, uh, now, actually, it makes it clear that that it's uh, it's uh, especially pharma industry, which you know, I know that this consumption actually of, of this, as I said, the drugs that helps you to, to the pain and get you some release is is a, such a billions and billions big industry. But I yeah. actually didn't realize that this uh, this. Uh, uh, drinks uh, company, drinking company that are producing the alcohol is actually also uh, stressed about all this process. And uh, the country that actually is mixed that is uh, is uh, Holland. It's the Netherlands. And uh, I saw that you have opened your branch there as a green line. Am I am I correct? Or or you have franchise? There? Yeah, we do. Um, actually, our pre our president Craig is over there right now at our at our office uh, in Amsterdam. We. Uh, got uh, a business over there. We we used to own a retail store. We recently sold that. Um, but what we do have in Amsterdam is a is a team of, of professionals that are managing uh, our our B two B business. We're working with sub distributors throughout that country and other European countries to get our products into smoke shops and head shops and some of the copy shops and 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 yeah. cannabis clubs. And then we also have an online business. So we run uh, uh, vaposhop.com, um, which is, a, or I don't know if it's .com, a vaposhop, which is a, uh, a business that, um, again, has these products similar to vapor, uh, to vapor.com in the U.S. Uh, vaposhop offers uh, some of our products in the EU. Yeah, I see. But what, uh, how is the situation in, in Canada uh, uh, comparing the U.S.? Are they also strict uh, on federal level or is it? more uh, more easy there for the um you know in in canada it was, it was the first uh you know large uh nation g7 nation to uh, legalize cannabis federally so what canada did well was they beat everybody to the punch and so there was these large companies that were able to attract significant investment um, including from big alcohol. So Canopy Growth has a, has a large investment from Constellation Brands, who is one of the biggest alcohol companies in the world. And uh, even uh, Kronos, who's up there as well, has an investment from Altria, which is one of the largest yes. uh, tobacco companies in the world. So um, this Canadian market has become much more investable because of the fact that it's federally legal and that the country has fully embraced it across the board. Uh, now, the problem that has arose in Canada is that the market is far too small for the amount of investment that has been made. So you have uh, billions of dollars coming in and these big, big companies getting grown, all competing over a relatively small market. I mean, Canada as a whole is smaller than the state of California, yeah. right, uh, uh, which is just one of the many states that we have uh, legal cannabis here in the U.S., right? So um, unfortunately, right, the companies that are listed in Can that are that are listed and they can list on the U.S. exchanges, but they're Canadian operators, they cannot operate in the U.S. I see. So you have the U.S. market, which is is the biggest market today from a volume standpoint, um, only can be operated by companies that are getting licenses and operating in the U.S. 
those companies and the bigger ones are called multi-state operators or MSOs. These, there's some really great companies. They're listed on a very small exchange in Canada called the Canadian Securities Exchange. Yeah. Why? Because again, they're federally illegal in the US, so they can't list on NASDAQ and they can't list on New York Stock Exchange. Now the Canadian counterparts, they get the listings so they get the benefits there, but they don't get to play in the market. Again, so you got to pick your poison oh uh, as to what do you want? Do you want to be able to service the largest market today and build your brand in the US yeah. um, and not have the same ability to list or access capital? Or do you want to have the listing, but you're in this you know very challenging Canadian market where these companies are losing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because there's just not enough market there for them to make money. Oh, it's like a, you know, running around your your tail. You're like you 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 can't escape from the that circle. And yeah, exactly. That, yeah, very well. And uh, the, this is actually very interesting that I want to mention that that Altria has invested in the cannabis, and that that was when I first actually saw, like when I when I go on Philip Morris website and I saw you know uh, building a world without uh, smoke. <laughs> I was surprised. Okay, you are the guys to talk about it. But then, yeah. of course, then ICOS shows up and then the other things. So they are, you know, very, okay, they are very smart. You can you must say that. So the move in this uh, cannabis industry was something that actually was uh, expecting that will fuel all this uh, 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 approval process that it will be accepted. So why it's not possible even for the, such a big company like Altria and Philip Morris to to change the rules? The other, uh, other players who are opposite it are stronger. Is that the reason? Yeah, well, no, uh, look, I think the they are trying to influence and they are trying to change. So you have competing groups lobbying, right? So you have the industry as it exists today in cannabis, which wants things to say generally the same, but they want to be federally legalized so that we can list on the exchanges and, and, and attract capital. And then you have uh, pharma who wants to obviously force this more of a medical FDA route so that you have to do clinical trials and get drug approval. And then you have tobacco and to some extent alcohol that wants to create a different framework where you can operate you know, nationally and go through uh, more of their channels that they're used to, right? Where, where are cigarettes sold or alcohol sold? Um, they don't wanna have to create a whole separate infrastructure uh, to go to the licensed cannabis dispensaries and deal with all the licensing regulatory that's in place today, right? So there's different, and that's maybe one of the reasons things haven't gotten done in Washington, D.C. is because, uh, you know, there's multiple voices. If everybody was uniform and aligned and preaching one path forward uh, and all the money was going behind that, maybe we would see quicker progress. So you have some competing factions yes. uh, that are that want things done differently. And I think the challenge, right, is it's still very early and a lot of the and the longer this thing goes, um, the more advantage that uh, the multi-state operators have, because this is they have a, a barrier to entry, right? If you're if you're Altria or Constellation, um, you, you can only invest up in a Canadian company, yes, right? That has very little uh, market share or or market uh, positioning. Whereas uh, what you really want is exposure to the U.S., but they can't get exposure to the US because then they would be now federally illegal. And you can't run a licensed alcohol business or licensed tobacco business and also have a federally illegal business as part of it. It's just not possible. So uh, they're now forced to sit on the sidelines and watch some of these companies become very, very big and robust. Uh, there's companies that are multi-state operators that just three or four years ago uh, they weren't even doing 50, uh, 50 million uh, annually in sales. Uh, those companies are now doing over a billion dollars yeah. in just four years time. Um, so they're growing very fast and uh, they're growing into every new market. So for example, New Jersey just started selling cannabis uh, not too long ago. And um, some of our customers, some of these multi-state operators, they have licenses in New Jersey, and they're benefiting in New Jersey. Um, New York is coming around the corner. They haven't started uh, their license program yet, even though they voted it in and made it legal, that's coming. So what an advantage that these multi-state operators have, they get to keep 
expanding into every new state, um, they're not getting competition from big business because it's still federally illegal. And now they're growing into multi-billion dollar businesses and building their brands. Um, and the longer that goes, the stronger their market position will be when the big competition comes in. Now, the trade-off to it is they don't have a lot of capital because there's not a lot of investors that want to invest. It's still very early. So investors came in early and thought, okay, we're going to invest now and then it's going to legalize and our investment will go up. Well, it took a lot longer to legalize. And a lot of those companies, um, they were forced to, they, their prime brokers wouldn't let them hold the stocks. And so they were forced to sell. There's a lot of stuff happening. Um, I think that represents the biggest opportunity still, right? Is this unlock where you have an opportunity to invest in companies today that most of the large investors, the institutional capital cannot invest in because they're federally illegal, because they're traded on the Canadian Securities Exchange, not NASDAQ, for whatever reason, that capital can't come in. So if you're an investor and you can invest today and you have a long-term horizon, you wait, it becomes federally legal. The companies can now list on NASDAQ and uplist on, onto New York Stock Exchange. Now all the institutional capital comes in and you'll get a huge return on your investment. So that's the, the investment thesis for the cannabis space um, especially if you're investing in plant touching companies or, or companies that actually own the licenses, that grow the cannabis, that sell the cannabis, uh, there's a good opportunity, but we don't know how long that's going to take. So your investment could languish for quite some time for maybe even several years until it really opens up. But I think most people agree that if you're buying a, a good solid company stock that's, that's uh, executing and operating well, over the next five to 10 years, that investment should perform pretty well. Uh, you listen very carefully when you say that actually there are multi-state companies. It's not it's not very often to hear like that some business, especially in US, is multi-state. It's not like a US market. It's usually to say right. international or globally. So that's a big obstacle for any kind of business. And you know, this is the, the I can imagine how difficult it is actually to work. It really that. It really hurts their ability to get uh, uh, efficiencies and economies of scale. Yeah. So, you know, if you if you imagine, uh, you know, uh, if you're a producer of, of alcohol in in uh, your neck of the woods, right, and you're in, in Serbia, but uh, you can't ship over the border to Croatia yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or ship to Germany, right? Yeah. Now you, you have a situation in the U.S. where you have to set up infrastructure in each of those markets so you have to set up a manufacturing plant to produce your alcohol in serbia then another plant yeah. in croatia another plant yeah. and think about the cost of that yeah, just, and that, it's just a few hundred uh, kilometers or miles around them but you still need to make it because there is a border so that's the case exactly the that's what's happened in the u.s really you, you can't, can't ship across state lines right now not even like with the trucks or nothing you, you can't you must oh that's no because if it's if you go across a state line, that becomes a federal crime, interstate trafficking. Oh my! But if you stay within the in the state, I understand? Yeah. Then you're legal because the state has made it legal. So you oh. know, people will have a. Uh, you could have a, a, a you know, one hundred thousand square foot grow, producing all these plants, on the California border, yes. and you you want to sell to Nevada? No. You need to build another twenty-five thousand square foot grow in Nevada. Yeah, just like on the Nevada <laughs> from that. Well, I understand, but yeah. they said, I, I always uh, uh, because now in this year it's actually you know when you read about these big investors' names like a uh, huge fund managers who made their uh, glory investing in the early stage of Amazon or Google or so on so on uh, you know like PayPal. And now when you look where, where you can invest, what can be, let's say, next big stories, there are, let's say, a few industries that shows up. It's like a 3D printing, I don't know, this hydrogen energy, which is hydrogen, which is, you know, that still has a potential. And of course, cannabis with all these uh, obstacles, as you said, there there will be, let's say, it must be changed. It's, it's ridiculous to to take it another, let's say, decades or two decades to, to be in this uh, stalemate position, like nothing changes. And, I think that, as you said, it's it's uh, it's now just uh, for the investors that feels and has a long term. 
it can be good, yeah. good bet. I, I really, I really like that that this what you explained to us. Yeah, and and, and it's interesting now because with uh, what's happened in in the macro economy with the recession uh, risk looming, you know, a lot of these companies are still considered risky, uh, obviously because the new industry is still illegal somewhat, right? Yeah. So these stocks have come way down. So I think now more than ever is is a is a great buying opportunity for the cannabis sector. I'm an investor in the cannabis sector myself. Yeah. Um, obviously, some of these companies are companies we do business with at Green Lane. We sell them products, um, but these companies are are doing really well. These are the actual plant touching companies. Um, the other option you have is obviously to invest in the ancillary companies. So the picks and shovels companies like Green Lane um, that don't touch the plant, and you can get exposure to these companies on major exchanges. We're listed on Nasdaq. Um, but there's other companies that sell like hydroponic supply equipment. So if you need to grow, um, growing cannabis is illegal, but selling grow lights or nutrients or soil, there's companies that do that. There's companies that uh, offer um, services, uh, consulting services. There's companies that are doing the real estate. So they own the real estate um, and then they're lease they're leasing it back to uh, the cannabis companies, uh, or they are, are lending to the cannabis companies. Um, so these companies that are benefiting uh, from the industry and, and providing services or products to the industry, um, but they're not actually touching the plant, um, that's another route that you can look at as an investor uh, for opportunity. Yeah, that's that's really the, the big choice. But companies, uh, of course, this is not advice, just you, you know, you, you are actually cooperating with all of them because you are on the on the other side of the this uh, cannabis industry what companies you think uh, are the biggest player and uh, doing their job very well yeah. so uh look right now i think is in a time of uncertainty um yeah. you know you want to uh, gravitate toward companies that are the most stable and uh have the strongest balance sheet and uh profitability metrics right so uh, in the cannabis industry specifically, uh, I, I would recommend looking at the top five multi-state operators or MSOs, um, and you can uh, see uh, those companies uh, listed on um, uh, New Cannabis Ventures is a website, newcannabisventures.com, and they, they rank all of the uh, cannabis companies by revenue, but you can also see what their profitability is. Um, so uh, just to name uh, what I think are the top five is uh, Green Thumb Industries uh, or GTI, uh, True Leave. Uh, you have Cresco, uh, who's completing a very big merger right now. And then you have Verano and uh, and you have Cureleaf. And Cureleaf actually has a, a, a exposure to the European market and they have a German business as well. So that's a very interesting one. Um, and, and those are the top five largest. And you look at these companies, they're all um, performing pretty well. Um, they have good, decent margins. They have uh, profitability, some more than others. Uh, and they have, you know, not only do they have good balance sheets today, but they can access capital because they're larger and more profitable. So I would stick with those now if you want to make a riskier bet, yes. um, obviously with more risk can come greater reward. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of companies that are, uh, you know, that have been beaten down. Um, so their valuation is is very low. Green Lane is one of those companies. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our, our price, yeah, for the last. Yeah, I mean, months. you know, our stock has, has gotten beat up a lot. Um, one of the reasons is we, we uh, have not been making money, right? And so we're working to get profitable right now. And I think investors want uh, you know, more security with their investment and, and it's more secure if the business is profitable, they're going to be more obviously able to self-sustain, right? So we know what we need to do at GreenLane, but, you know, for example, GreenLane, you know, even though uh, last quarter that we reported was, uh, you know, close to 40 million in sales and we just pre-announced we're probably going to be tad under 30 million in sales last quarter. Yes. But, you know, if you do a run rate, that's north of 100 million, and our stock is, our company's worth, you know, closer to 10 million, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, because of uh, just the fact that it's 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 gotten beat up. So, you know, the, the valuations are much lower on, um, you know, you look at cannabis, maybe there's the tier one MSOs that I mentioned, and then everybody else below, uh, the valuations are better, but that's because there's more risk, right? So as an investor, I think, 
you know, you can feel safer investing in those blue chip MSOs um, because they're not losing money, they're making money. Um, and then do your homework and see where, pick your spots um, where you might want to take a little bit more risk uh, to get a bigger reward uh, because a company that is, uh, you know, worth a uh, billion dollars, uh, they have to be worth $10 billion for you to make 10 times your money. Yeah. Whereas a company that's worth $10 million, yeah. uh, they only have to be worth a hundred million for you to make 10 times your money. So uh, with the, some of the multiples that have come down and the valuations being so small, I think there's a big opportunity for, for larger upside, but with more risk, uh, and and definitely do your homework and 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 look around and uh, I mentioned New Cannabis Ventures is a good site uh, they have a lot of good information on there uh, but uh, you know a lot of these companies are publicly traded so their financials are available and you can do your diligence and 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 understand your risk appetite and understand uh, where you want to play. Well, definitely, as I said, everybody needs to do their own homework, but. Uh, I, I like to, to go to that website that you recommend and I like to see the news because uh, especially at Greenline, I, I see many new things are happening. You are making some, some new movements, finding new partners in uh, other countries like in Puerto Rico. So you are just, you know, keep going and going. And as you said, with these with this, uh, old obstacles that you have, you try to do your best. And I also uh, like what you said, the, the, what is, uh, you know, the risk profit reward is something that everybody needs to calculate. And, you know, with your revenue, which are quite huge, the, you know, the market value is so difficult. But I think it also has a, uh, uh, it's connected with the whole environment uh, and um, stock markets right. and uh, stagflation. It is everybody, people try to get rid of the risky stocks first and the risky investment like crypto, and probably cannabis is very close to crypto, uh, yep. uh, their perspective. Yep, you're, you're spot on. I think, uh, you know, when the, everything was rolling and, you know, people w- would get into the risk stuff and everybody went into crypto and, and cannabis. And then as soon as there's uh, trouble on the horizon and people are fearful, uh, those are the first ones to sell off. And we saw, you know, crypto obviously lose trillions of dollars. Yeah. Cannabis has lost, uh, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, I believe in crypto as well. It doesn't mean these industries are going away. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, every year more people are consuming cannabis uh, legally and illegally than the year prior uh, because it's becoming more popular. It's legalizing in more markets. It's becoming more normalized and destigmatized. Um, so it's going to be a, a huge industry. It's going to be, I think, bigger than alcohol. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be more looking like caffeine or maybe like coffee. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to take time. And I think the, the market's going to go through its cycles and, you know, you, 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 you get, get, uh, obviously rewarded if you're, if you're early. Um, but, uh, there's going to be a lot of volatility and we saw this with Bitcoin, you know, still today. Um, you know, it's, if you look at it over the last 10 years, uh, obviously it's only gone up. But if you bought it at uh, sixty thousand dollars of Bitcoin, uh, you're not too happy right now. You know, at twenty thousand. So, um, you know, I think it'll go up uh, long term. And I own some Bitcoin, and I think cannabis is obviously going to go up and, and is here to stay. It's just, it's going to be a staple industry, um, and timing investments is hard. That's why you got to have the long term mindset. And if you believe in in the industry and and where it's going to go, um, you know, you you do your research and buy companies that you like. Uh, chances are in five or 10 years, you're going to be glad you did that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, tell me, <clears throat> in uh, till 2018, actually all the, the market, the cannabis companies and the industry was growing, but what's happened in that year when every, after that moment, it like reached the peak and then start collapsing on the, on the stock market at least. What is the reason? Yeah, well, what, what happened was, um, you know, we, we had a uh, California legalized, Yes. And, and that was sort of people thought a big domino to fall. And uh, people saw an opportunity for further, pro- quicker progress at the federal level. And a lot of money was pouring into the sector. Now, you you fast forward to 2020, um, you know, and the sector kind of lost momentum a little bit. And then 2020 comes. We have the Democrats taking control of, mm-hmm. of Congress and all the stocks shot up again. And people say, OK, now they're going to legalize. Well, that was two years ago and we've seen everything come down and down and down and down everyone's waiting where's the legalization where's the progress and it keeps tracking down so 
Now we we hear uh, as of yesterday that there may be some uh, action in Congress, a, a bill called Safe Banking that we've been waiting on. Um, Senate Majority Leader Schumer has said that that's uh, likely to get done here. So we'll see. Um, but I think that's that's the big reason that the sector has cooled off is because uh, people thought, OK, you know, this is easy. We we put our money in now and then, uh, you know, a few weeks later, a few months later, uh, it becomes legal and, you know, it goes to the moon. Um, and then as it takes longer and longer for that to play out, uh, people pull their money out or, or, or various reasons, uh, the macro economy as well. But that's the, the, the capital markets have suffered. I think the interesting thing about cannabis is. Uh, today than in 2018, uh, sales of the for these companies is much larger today than it was in 2018, but all the stocks are down. Yeah. Uh, tremendously. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. Yeah, but uh, as you said, my background is financial markets and stock markets. And uh, I actually see that all the time that uh, the stock prices and the movement on the market are never are, aren't always related only with the financial performances or the results and the industry. It's, it's more about uh, the you know somebody who wants to get the profit or has the, to invest. So obviously the investing, as you said, in the in the in the cannabis companies aren't for the traders it's for the investors so that's uh, the huge difference and uh, when i explain to you know my my clients and the, the people who want to invest on stock market i always focus on investing not trading is it yeah. like the problems with uh, with the cannabis industry there are not so many investors exactly uh i mean look i think it's in general uh you know our our culture is um you know, with social media and everything, I mean, yeah. people just move on. You know, that's why a lot of people admire Warren Buffett. Yes. Uh, you know, and they look at him uh, as kind of being one of the old school, uh, you know, long term, uh, you know, long, long focused investors. And, you know, I think today everybody's, you know, wants to get rich quick and, uh, you know, they want to move to the next hot thing. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate because I think a lot of people have, gotten burned over the last year and uh, you know now we're seeing um credit card you know savings decline credit card debt increase and you know luckily we still have a pretty good economy for jobs uh you know people are still employed there's a lot of open positions but uh you know you kind of wonder uh how this is going to play out and everyone's expecting obviously a, a further recession um but some people think it'll be a, a slight recession and, and bounce back you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, you guys are experiencing, I'm sure, a lot over there, you know, with with the conflict with Russia and, and Ukraine and the oil prices. And, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. So I think, um, you know, now's now's the time to uh, definitely, uh, you know, make smart bets. Um, but, uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, if you're going to allocate capital, um, but maybe you know, a three, five, 10 year horizon is a better approach. Uh, I, I'm born in 1971 and uh, in during the war in uh, former Yugoslavia, then uh, Serbia has suffered the third largest hyperinflation in the history. You can imagine that we have the, wow. the you know, one, uh, let's say like paper uh, uh, the, that was worth like 100,000 uh, billions dinars and it was worth like one German mark. So, you know, you, we were just, you know, with your whole salary, like uh, you, you can buy just one uh, chocolate. That was the what we lived like for a year. It was crazy. You, you can imagine. So now this, I remember that I was student in that period, you know, and uh, eating cabbage, for, you know, all year. Wow. But that was something that actually makes us, uh, let's say, very, very calm about this crisis. Okay, it's it's happening. And as you say that, that's why I focus, it's, it will pass. It, it will be passed. And you know who who is now acting um, uh, calm and looking on the long term, he will make uh, make money. And uh, you see yeah. that it's fantastic actually comparison between Warren Buffett and you know this uh, celebritization of the of the whole investing uh, with this Robin Hood, this to the moon. You say that to the moon phrase, yeah. it's just like you know in the in the commercial when you walk some uh, watch some commercial of some uh, stock brokers, they use that. Uh, Let's go to the moon. It's it's not fair. It's just, you know, like make people trading uh, and get some, 
you know, like expectation that they will make money and then they ruin, they, they use a margin a lot. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the investors need to actually, investors need to be educated about investing. Not It's now so easy, like everything. And then everybody thinks, okay, let's make some money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's, if you're, if you're doing it that way, it's, it's no different than gambling, right? Mm -hmm. and, and certainly you can hit, you can, uh, you know, you can get rich in Vegas, but uh, if you've been to Vegas, uh, there's a lot of nice casinos there. And they are they weren't built so nice because everybody's getting rich. So most people lose money. <laughs> and if you if, if you're gonna play the stock market like that as well, right? You're probably gonna lose money too. So um, you know, it's it, investing is very different than trading, as you mentioned. And uh, you know, experienced traders can 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 perform well, but most inexperienced traders will not. Yeah. Um, but most people that invest are gonna make money if you hold. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah. I think you mentioned this, and I actually think that uh, when I listened to the Federal Reserve uh, head uh, Powell, one journalist asking, uh, "Okay, that means that 1.5 million Americans will lose their job. That you can feel uh, okay with the inflation to get down." So, but you said now the the, the employment market is still very hot, and uh, I I realized that in in Europe, in Serbia also, there are there is a lack of the of the of the people who you know who can who, of qualified employees, and you cannot pay them uh, you know less or fire them because you can run your job. Yeah, no, it's an interesting uh, dynamic because you know it's like uh, right now, uh, good news is bad news because if yes. the jobs report comes out and and there's uh, it's doing well, yeah. then that means that uh, the Fed and uh, Powell is going to raise rates more. Yeah. And so if people see a good jobs report, they, then they, they oh, sell oh, the stock. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny, but, uh, yeah. you know, look, I think it's, um, I think the pain that they've, uh, that they're going to inflict from the raises they've already done, and they're going to raise again here in November, but I think it's enough, right? I think that it's going to, you're going to, it's not going to happen overnight. You know, you don't raise rates and then all of a sudden inflation goes down. Yes. It takes time. So I think they've, they've raised enough. I think there's enough. I mean, markets have slowed down completely. I mean, commercial real estate and, um, you know, even residential real estate, I mean, they're, they're down tremendously, right? And so you're going to see a lot of cutbacks in those industries uh you know far less deals getting done and you know i think you need to just wait and see some of that play out I mean, they're taking more of the approach that they're going to keep raising every month i think that's uh going to lead to further pain right because at some point then you're just going to see jobs be eliminated and uh you know you're going to see massive economic pain and, and you're going to see people uh you know defaulting on their credit card debts and things like that so you know, they, they originally wanted to do more of a soft landing. I think they're, um, you know, probably uh, a little, you know, overextended and, and they're going to they're going to miss on that. Um, but, you know, I'm not in charge. So I just uh, I just got to react like everyone else. And I think, you know, one thing to, to certainly pay attention to right now is your own, um, you know, your own personal exposure in terms of debt. You know, if you have obviously debt that's you know variable, then your rates are going up and, and your payments are going to go up. Uh, if you can eliminate debt right now, um, you know, ha ha you know, spend less money than you make, um, save money and invest in this time, uh, that it's gonna it could pay off in a big way. Yeah, and that's that's uh, very interesting because we are podcast about investing, and of course, you explain this you know fantastic about the trends in cannabis industry. Uh, where do you invest, uh, like uh, personally? How you you manage your your wealth or portfolio? Yeah, uh, great question. So you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I have exposure to a lot of different startup businesses. I've started a couple other businesses as well. Um, these are obviously very risky, uh, as we've seen with uh, with Greenlane over the last year, and our stock has come down a lot. Um, so you know, these are businesses that uh, you know I invested my own money and you know my own time. Um, and, and, uh, real estate's always a good investment. Um, you know, I've done some uh, multifamily apartment investing um, and also uh, purchase some of my own properties. Um, I've also uh, diversified into gold, which has not performed very well uh, into, into gold and metals. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, it feels it feels safe. Uh, and then um, also, uh, you know, I've done some some uh, some venture investing too. Um, you know, some some other uh, you know more high interest debt uh, opportunities that I've had. Um, but right now, I've been more focused on um, investments that generate cash flow because uh, I think cash is king uh, during this time. And so, uh, you know, investment and, and you see that in the stock market, a lot of the companies doing well are the div high dividend companies Yes, because uh, people are moving their money into uh, into cash flowing assets uh, across the board. Um, and then I think, you know, we'll see what happens here, but I think there's going to be a lot of really good opportunities uh, to buy companies at the press. I mean, we're seeing it in cannabis already, but yeah. um, you know, just in general uh, that could play out over the next year. So I think you want to have, uh, cash uh, to be able to be opportunistic and jump on those opportunities when they pop up. And that's how you're going to get the really, really big returns. Yeah, I agree. And then uh, uh, actually, uh, because we have some small delay because of internet, uh, you said that you invest in uh, in some startups, in venture projects like entrepreneur, then on the stock markets and gold. I cure that. <laughs> that you, you say, anybody, everybody needs some rest. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Said gold is not performing that well. And are, are you buying some ETFs? Because I usually recommend that to the, someone who is starting to invest, like to feel a little bit, let's say, not not so volatile, like like ETFs. Do you invest in some of them? Yeah, you know, actually, um, I, I actually have some money in a cannabis ETF. Uh, there's okay. one on, on uh, Nasdaq called uh, MSOS. So is that uh, which, actually the good, uh, the good, uh, let's say, option for somebody who want to exposure to the cannabis industry? Yeah, because the 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 MSOS they own. Uh, majority of their portfolio are those uh, top five uh, US MSOs that I mentioned. Yes. Uh, yes. So it's a good way to get exposure to those companies through NASDAQ because MSOS is on NASDAQ. Yeah. Um, but there's other there's other uh, good uh, ETFs as well. Poseidon is another one uh, that that is good. Um, you know, you can look them up, uh, the cannabis ETFs and, and see what their exposure is to which companies. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are a few on the NASDAQ, the the um, uh, the Poseidon EDF, I just looked it up, is PSDN is the okay. ticker, uh, PSDN. So yeah, I have some, but you know, look, I think, uh, you know, getting into maybe some technology ETFs uh, I'm considering right now because they've been beaten up so much, you yeah. know, everything's come down so much. I think this is maybe a good time. And, uh, you know, again, it, with ETFs, I think you you want to invest. You know, it's like you believe in it, you put your money in, and and it's going to go up over the long haul. Uh, I think it's a good recommendation, um, but not uh, not necessary for trading right now. Yeah, not for trading, but uh, and as I said, and uh, uh, in this period of pain, because because pain is something that is very often recommend uh, you know mentioned in uh, this uh, government guys who talk about it probably one of the best uh, solution is cannabis <laughs> isn't it <laughs> it's great against pain so uh, yeah plus I, I really want to thank you and and thank you for your time i think this was you know the great really you know the, the, the you share so much of your knowledge and experience to to me and to my my listeners and i'm sure that this will be Listen globally, not uh, multi-state. <laughs> yeah, we can cross. We can cross lines with this one. Yes, this one. Thank you again, yeah. and I wish all the best to you, to your teammates, and to your you know Green Line and all your investments. And uh, I'm really looking forward to maybe you know host you one day to join us to, to Serbia and maybe you know you know again to repeat this to see what's new in a, in a year or so, and then to see what's happened there. So. We should, oh, I would love. I would love to. Uh, I'd love to make a trek over there. So let's plan to keep in touch. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, you know, hopefully we can get legal cannabis uh, over in your neck of the woods at some point too. That'd be great. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's from my side. What we can do and try to. Uh, there are some small changes in that direction. So hope there will be some good news that I can share with you about that. If, yeah. If you hear if you hear any good news, you let me know right away. <laughs> okay. All the best. Thank All right, you thank you for listening. This uh, this was Sensal Insight with Nikolas Kovacevic. I hope you enjoyed as myself. So see you on the next next time. Take care. Bye, bye, Nikolas. All right, bye.